in there. Yes, you know, you yes Lord. It. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Glory to God. Right Please heal Lord. 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 In Jesus' name. We speak Jesus over everyone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I speak Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise Woo. God. Thank Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. If if you are the one that had that blood clot, I just feel like if you'll come on out and down to the front, we lay hands on you, you'll get healed right now. Okay. Amen. I want some of you to gather around Tammy and just lay hands on her. Let's speak in faith, believing for God's healing touch. That's right, there's a history here. Yes, in Jesus' name, we're speaking healing. In the name of Jesus, be healed. Father, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus for this blood clot to dissolve. Ooh, glory to God. Let it dissolve and break up and pass through and... Thank you for good blood flow. Jesus, glory to God. Thank you for new energy <laughs> and new strength. Woo! Glory to God. Father, we just proclaim that Tammy will be able to experience new strength, strength like she hasn't had lately. Woo! Ability glory to do more, to go glory further, God. to not get worn out, to Woo! not be tired, to not be exhausted. <laughs> Oh, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, for my family, I speak the holy name. Ooh, glory, to glory to God. 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 Oh, shout Jesus for the mountain. Jesus in the street. Jesus, so Yes, Jesus. Jesus for my Jesus. family. Jesus, glory to God. I speak to Jesus for my family. Jesus. Jesus, glory to God. Hallelujah. Ooh. Sing that Praise part again. Lord. Shout <laughs> Jesus. Thank you for your name, Lord. Thank you for your name. Jesus in the street. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Jesus in the dark. Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I speak the holy name, Jesus. What's more, glory to God. Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name of Jesus. Ooh, Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. Her hands towards Timber right now. We're praying for Timber. Woo! She had a Glory recent God. diagnosis this with rheumatoid arthritis. We just need God to touch her. Yes. Father, in the name of Jesus, Glory. we're declaring healing yes. for Glory Timber to today. God. Glory to God. Minister Glory by your spirit to her right now, God. Touch her and make her own In the name of Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Jesus. We thank you for soreness to go away. Your name of our inflammation to decrease. We thank you for your healing to flow in her body. In the name of Jesus. Over words that are used by man to describe the Lord. Your name is Jesus. Your name is Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness, every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the 
Give your neighbor a high five. God Woo! bless you, and you can be seated. And, uh, we're so thrilled and honored to have you with us today. Hey, I should have mentioned earlier about our giving, and I don't think I did. I think that you guys know. In fact, most of you give electronically Sunday, and next Sunday, Easter Sunday. The theme is Arise. That's what's in my heart. I am celebrating that Jesus has risen from the dead. But I'm also feeling like you and I, we need to rise up more than ever before in our world in this time. Amen? How many of you agree Amen. with that? Amen. There's a beautiful verse from Isaiah chapter 60, verse number 1. And it really is a beautiful backdrop to these two weeks. You know, Isaiah prophesied 700 years ahead of time how Jesus would come. He had some amazing, specific prophecies about Jesus. And look at this. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1 reads like this. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises Amen. upon you. Amen. I love that. Arise. Rise up. The Lord rises upon you. Today's sermon is called you can take a hike. And I'll give you more explanation on that here in a few minutes. But you really can take a hike today. You're going to get the chance. We begin today by reading Matthew chapter 21. It's the account of the triumphal entry. This is when Jesus entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And by the way, that's what we're celebrating today. Six days later, of course, He would die on the cross. But this is how that week began. Matthew chapter 21, verses 7 to 11. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. I want to share something with you over the, these two Sundays that is so beautiful that my fear is I won't be able to adequately teach it. I, I pray that I can share the things that are stirring in my heart about what what God did at Easter time. What an amazing thing Jesus did by coming into Jerusalem. Um, in fact, the first point I want to bring out this morning is, number one, Jesus predicts His death with great precision. Jesus predicts His death with great precision. He's not ambiguous. He's right to the point. It's more than just scanning the headlines on the internet and speculating. 
He tells his closest followers exactly what's going to happen. They will whip me, they will scourge me, they will kill the Son of Man, and then I will rise from the dead. He told them ahead of time, not once, not twice, but three specific times. Here's the first time, Matthew chapter 16. Look at this. Uh, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and chief priests and teachers of the law, and that He must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. It's the same word as Isaiah used, arise. I really want to emphasize this week to be raised to life. He says to them that this is what's going to happen, this is the plan, but they refuse it. Um, they resist it, at least Peter does. We think all of them, and all of them do eventually. Uh, Peter says, never, uh -uh, not happening, not on my watch, they will never kill you, Jesus. Right? Isn't that how Peter responded? I just got through telling you that you're the Messiah, the Son of God, and you agreed with that. And now immediately you're telling me that you're going to die on a cross? No way. Never going to happen. Not going to allow it. And Jesus rebukes that satanic thought. And Jesus tells them, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to take up your cross and follow me. And then immediately he takes them on a six day journey up to the top of the mountain. We call it the Mount of Transfiguration. And up on top of the mountain, Jesus is transfigured right before their very eyes. His clothes become bright. They become like light. It's just a white brilliance. And all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah flank him on the right and on the left. Amen. And they're standing there talking with Jesus. And this is where Peter has one of his biggest gaffes. <laughs> right? Peter says, Lord, this, this is just wonderful. There's Moses and Elijah and you. Let us build three tabernacles. One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. But the interesting thing about it, one translation says it this way. Not knowing what to say, he said. Now just think about that for a moment. Not knowing what to say, he said. Now there are some people who speak because they have something to say. And then there are other people who speak because they just have to say something. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and sometimes Peter was in that second category. But if I'm honest, I can relate to Peter, can you? Have you ever been kind of like old Peter? However, the voice of God sounds out, this is my beloved son, with him I am well pleased, listen to him. And as they're leaving, Peter says something that's really a great question. Wait a minute, Lord, wait, why are we leaving? Wasn't that Elijah back there on the mountain? Don't all the prophets say that Elijah must come first? And then the appearance, and Jesus says, it sure does. And actually, Elijah has already appeared, but they didn't recognize him. Of course, you and I have the advantage of looking back. We're not living it firsthand, in person. We get to look back, and we know that he was actually talking about John the Baptist. That John the Baptist was the fulfillment of Elijah, the prophet appearing. But from there, he heals a demon-possessed boy. 
you know, nose to the grindstone. He's continuing in the ministry. He simply encounters more ministry opportunities. And then he tells them the game plan again. Matthew chapter 17, verse number 22. When they came together in Galilee, he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill Him. And on the third day, He will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. And if you and I had been His disciples, we would be filled with grief. That's twice now, Lord. What do you mean you're going to die? Stop this foolish talk. No, 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 you're going to start your kingdom now. This is how it works. We go into Jerusalem, you're going to overthrow Rome, you'll work a few miracles, and then we're off and running. What, what is this talk about you dying? But then he just returns to ministry again straight away. He provides a coin in the mouth of a fish to pay taxes for Peter and himself. He does a large-scale teaching session about who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He warns about the ones who cause the little ones to stumble. He teaches a parable about sheep wandering away. He gives us basic instruction how to deal with sin in the church, how to confront conflict with one another lovingly. He's mixing in teaching about marriage and divorce. And, and someone brings some little children to him and the disciples don't want the children to bother Jesus, but Jesus says, are you kidding? This is what the kingdom is made of. These little children. He teaches several parables. The unmerciful servant. The rich man in the kingdom of God. The workers in the vineyard. And then it happens. He predicts His death and resurrection again. A third time. Matthew chapter 20, verse 17. Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. Very important words. He's going up, and I do mean up, to Jerusalem. It's quite a hike. And on the way... He took the twelve aside and He said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn Him to death and will hand Him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Arise, shine, for the glory of the Lord is shining upon you and arises upon you. Not only is He going to go up to Jerusalem, but He is moving up to this masterful plan of salvation. And He's calling you and me to go up with Him. Now, then after this, this is the third time. Third time he says, I'm going to die and rise from the dead. And then it's right back into the ministry narrative. He's dealing with James and John. Remember that? Their mama wanted them to sit at the right hand of Jesus in the kingdom. I can just hear the other disciples. But well, you've got to get your mama to come and try to get you to sit beside Jesus. And that's going on. And, and she wants her sons to be honored. And shortly after this, in fact, in fact, just a few verses later, verse 29, chapter 20, as Jesus is healing two blind men, it mentions something very important, and that is that it happened as they were leaving Jericho. Look at this. In fact, the second, the second point I want to share with you before we read this text. Jesus didn't run from the cross. Rather, He embraced it. Let that wash over you for a moment. 
Jesus could have called 10,000 angels. I don't deserve this. Get rid of these Roman soldiers. I want to be delivered. I want to go back to heaven and I want to do it now. But he embraced the cross. <clears throat> what kind of love is that? For you and for me. He doesn't run from it. He embraces the cross. And then we see this, this very clearly in the words found in Matthew chapter 20. It's such an important text. There's so much going on here, but listen to this. Matthew chapter 20, verse number 29. As Jesus and His disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed Him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on us. Well, the crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Can you not just see it in Jericho? Finally, the famous teacher Jesus is coming to our town. Jesus is coming to church on Sunday. We want everybody to be prim and proper. We got the you know, the grounds are manicured. We got the carpets cleaned. The, the, the seat cushions have been cleaned with the, you know, the jet spray. We got it looking nice in here. We don't got time for any of you blind people to be disrupting our parade. Actually, what, what these two blind men were doing was starting the parade. They started it all the way in Jericho. And it would culminate in Jerusalem. Son of David, have mercy on us. Now, of course, you know that these two blind men were healed. But what I want you to focus upon is that they were leaving Jericho. That's an important marker. And one other thing, that they called him Son of David. That's an important point. It's so important because the trip from Jericho to Jerusalem is a steep climb. It's important because this is the last act, Matthew says, before the triumphal entry. And it's important because when the Messiah comes, He will come in the Son of David mentality. He will fulfill that kingdom that began all those centuries ago. And here they are calling Him Son of David. It's equivalent to saying, Messiah, we recognize You. Do You have time to heal us? And of course He does. And the reference to David is important. David was the greatest king in the history of Israel. Next week, I want to show you an amazing connection between David's kingdom and Jesus' kingdom. David reigned over Judah in the city of Hebron seven and a half years, and then he went to Jerusalem where he reigned 40 years. And here is Jesus. He's coming out of Jericho, 800 feet below sea level, and he's climbing up towards Jerusalem to the sound shouts of, Son of David, have mercy on us. I want to show it to you this morning. You can go on a hike. You can just take a hike. Jesus took His disciples along the familiar path out of Jericho up to Jerusalem, and I do mean up. Imagine that you're taking a hike, and you see here the ruins of ancient Jericho, and it's a 14-mile hike uphill most of the way. A person in good shape can do it in eight or nine hours. Jesus and His disciples did it multiple times. I would love to do it sometime in my life. Who's with me? <laughs> so you start out at Jericho and you climb up along the ridge called the ancient 
ascent of Adumim. It's called the Red Trail. It winds along a steep ridge line. Off to the right, you've got the Wadi. It's a deep valley. And up to the left, you have the fortress of Cypras. It was built by Herod the Great. Uh, he named it after his own mother. And as you're walking along, you can see down below you the St. George Monastery, built in the 4th century. Amazing! It's beautiful. They actually renovated it. Now they have running water and electricity. Of course, you're going to see sheep all along the way. Very little vegetation, but tons of sheep, tons of goats, as you're walking along this pathway, um, moving towards Jerusalem. A scent of a dumen has to do with that red color. Some people say it's because of the red rock in the canyon walls. Other people say it's because of how much blood has been shed through the years along this trail. And off to the right you have the valley called the Wadi Kelt. A really deep canyon. You stay on the ridge, winding your way up, avoiding the desert below. You keep seeing ancient forts all along the way. And when you reach the crest of Adubim, you merge with a modern highway. And for about two miles, you're walking alongside that highway. And then as you walk that ancient Roman road, you can see off in the distance the three towers of the Mount of Olives. That's your signal. We're halfway there. We're getting closer. That was the most treacherous journey in the New Testament times. This very trail is the same one that Jesus was referring to when He said there was an innocent man traveling along. He got abducted and beat and left in the dead. He was robbed and, and they stole everything He had and thought he had killed, they had killed Him. The story of the Good Samaritan. You can still see the roadway there, the trail of the ancient path. But before too long, you arrive at what is the eastern shoulder of the Mount of Olives. It's, it's a, a relatively flat place now, and, and there's a big settlement there. And now you can clearly see the three towers of the Mount of Olives. And you're going to wind around towards Bethany and Bethphage. And uh, these are ancient villages. It was at Bethphage where Jesus got on a mule and rode the rest of the way. They would have taken that fork in the road, the ancient fork in the road. They literally took that trail and built the highway over it. And Jesus would have taken to the left and veered around, making His way up to the Mount of Olives, just like you're doing as, as you hike up. And now you continue your climb and you come to the Mount of Olives and now you begin to see Jerusalem off in the distance. The only thing between you and Jerusalem is the Kidron Valley, 450 feet down and 450 feet back up the other side. You end your 14 mile hike by climbing up to the top and there, that's where you begin entering the city of Jerusalem with Jesus riding on a donkey and the crowd shouting, Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Hoshana! God saves! Hoshana! And they're singing. They're taking palm fronds. I hope you were greeted by our greeters out front with the palm fronds this morning. We're just having a little fun with that. I meant to bring one with me to the pulpit. Man, I mean, they're waving the palm fronds. They're throwing down their cloaks in front of Him as Jesus walks by. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the Son of David. Lord, have mercy on us. Willing to climb up higher with Jesus. I've been amazed by our, our church family over recent days, I feel like we're climbing up higher with Jesus. I feel like God's giving us favor in areas. Amen. Amen. Ministering to the needy of our community, able to give them produce. What a blessing that is. It'll happen again April 22nd. 
Uh, Joanna needs some of you to help and to volunteer. If you can stand at a table and put produce in a bag, you're, you're hired. <laughs> if you can set up tables, or if, even if you say, I don't mind from time to time to take my pickup to go, to go pick it up. Last time we had two pickup trucks full and that wasn't enough. And it's amazing. It's an amazing door that God's opened up. And yesterday our ladies with the yard sale heads off to you. It was another beautiful touch point of love to our community. It was more than just raising money for women's conference. It was, it was people coming onto our property and, and being comfortable with being here and interacting with friendly people. I'm fielding more and more comments about, oh, you are that church. I love being that church. That's right. Do you? I mean, that not that what it's all about? Showing the love of Jesus to our neighbors and to our friends. And as I think about my own life, there are areas where I simply, I need to climb up higher with Jesus. I, I don't want to stay down here. I want to climb up. The days are going by so fast, so rapidly. I don't want to get to the end of my life with regrets. Yes. We have a chance. We have a team. We have a beautiful team. I'm praying that next Sunday we have many, many guests from our community. And Verado Campus Praise is planning God. for many guests from the community. We have an opportunity to touch our world for Jesus. Amen. But if we're going to do it, we have to be up higher. We're going to have to climb up higher with Him. I don't want to stay Praise down in the low-lying low ground. I, I want to ascend. And I'm calling upon you, arise, Praise God. shine, for your light has come. Mm. The glory of the Lord is resting upon us. Yeah. Let's, don't, let's don't hoard it to ourselves, but let's give it away. Let's share it with our neighbors. I invite... Um, the worship team to come back up. We're going to sing that last song one more time. Mm. And just simply, I'm asking you to respond. Be asking yourself, what ways can I go up higher with Jesus? If you will pray, the Holy Spirit will prompt you. He'll point out some things to you. He really will do that. Did you know that? He'll give you your action steps for this coming week. Did you know He can do that? Mm -hmm. So I, I invite you to worship with us and just sing with us. And um, I am going to grab that microphone. Thank you, Pastor Dale. Thank you so much. If you feel like standing, then stand up. If you want to stay seated, stay seated. But we are we're responding to the message. That's what we're doing. We're asking Jesus, how do I go up higher? Sing with me. I just want to speak. 